Hey everybody, welcome to day 103 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. I'm so glad that you decided to join us again today. And we have a wonderful section of scripture as always in the stories of King David. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, during the Cold War years, Brother Andrew, as we called him, was famous for smuggling Bibles and Christian literature into the communist bloc countries. On his first ever foray into one of the communist countries, he was passing through free Austria into communist Yugoslavia. And remember, if he got caught smuggling, he could go to prison and it could be even much worse than that. And so he's ready to go through the guards checkpoint, uh, the border guard crossing, and um, they're taking a lot of time with, with each car and he sees, you know, they're, they're really scrutinizing everything. And so it's almost his turn. He says, Lord, in my luggage, I have scripture that I want to take to your children across this border. When you were on earth, you made blind eyes see. Now I pray, make seeing eyes blind. Do not let the guards see those things you do not want them to see. And then it was his turn. And the guards came around his car. Uh, they emptied his car. They were patting down his tent. In the tent packaging were, were boxes of Christian literature and Bibles. And his sleeping bag, in the sleeping bag, Bibles. They're, they're patting this. They open his suitcase. And they're talking outside the car, opening the suitcase. They lift his clothes out of the top of the suitcase. And there in plain view is gospel literature sitting right there. And they talk a little bit. And they put it together uh, back the way it was and wave him through. And he got through. Amazing. And the Lord had to do that many times for him in the course of his career, helping the Christians behind the Iron Curtain. Today we're going to read about a frightening war in which two great generals of David agree to do their part for God, to be valiant for God and his people, but then just to leave the rest up to his preferences. And it's a wonderful example to us all about how to fight our battles in life every day. So today, 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 in the King James Version of the Bible with updated vocabulary. Here we go. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then David said, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, their lord, Do you think that David does honor your father, that he has sent comforters to you? Has not David rather sent his servants to you to search out the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it? Therefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. And when they told it to David, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Remain at Jericho until your beards are grown and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, and the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maacah, 1,000 men, and of Ishtob, uh, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and Rehob and Ishtob and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the line of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai his brother, so that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the children of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good cheer, uh, be of good courage. And let us play the men for our people, and for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seems to him good. And Joab drew near, and the people who were with him, unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians had fled, then they fled also before Abishai and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were stricken down before Israel, they gathered themselves together, and Hadarezer sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river, and they came to Helam, and Shobak, the captain of the army of Hadarezer, went before them. 
And when it was told to David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of Syrians and 40,000 horsemen, and struck down Shobak, their, the captain of their army, who died there. And when all the kings that were servants to Hadar Rezer saw that they were stricken down before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the children of Ammon anymore. Chapter 11. And it came to pass after the year had expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David remained still at Jerusalem. It came to pass in the evening that David rose up from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in to him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house." And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah had come to him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a gift of food from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from your journey? Why then did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camped in the open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next day. And when David had called him, he ate and drank before him. He made him drunk. And at evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him so that he might be stricken down and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people, the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. And he commanded the messenger, saying, When you have made an end of telling the matters of the war to the king, and if so be that the king's anger rises up and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? who smote uh, Abimelech, the son of Jerubbesheth. Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go so near to the wall? Then say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were... uh, we were able to push them back even to the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, This is what you shall say to Joab. Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and got her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. 
The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little female lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler to the rich man, and he did not wish to take of his own flock and of his own herd to prepare for the traveling man who had come to him, but took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man that had come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus declares the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would also have given unto you many more such things. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus declares the Lord, See, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. But because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore for David, and it was very sick. David therefore begged God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house rose up and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat food with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, See, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he would not listen to our voice. How will he then trouble himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, what thing is it that you have done that you fasted and wept for the child while it was alive? But when the child was dead, you rose up and ate food. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why therefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba his wife and went in to her and lay with her. And she bore a son and he called his name Solomon and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. And Joab fought against Reba of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Reba and have taken the city of waters. Now, therefore, gather the rest of the people together and camp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. And David gathered all the people together and went to Reba and fought against it and took it. And he took their king's crown from off his head the weight of which was a talent of gold with the precious stones. And it was set on David's head, and he brought forth the plunder of the city in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were in it and put them under saws, under harrows of iron, and under axes of iron, and made them pass through the brick kiln. And thus he did to all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. And that concludes... 
2 Samuel chapter 12. All right, so as you can see, as we started out in chapter 10, verses 9 through 12, we see this really great section where it shows something about Joab's faith. Joab uh, was not a stellar character, but on this occasion, he shows great faith. And so we have the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, and the Syrians in alliance against the Israelites. And so Joab tells his brother Abishai, well, you fight against the Syrians, and if it's too hard for you, then I'll come and help you. And I'll fight against the Ammonites, and if it's too hard for me, you come and help me. And what's so great is it, it seems like it never occurred to Joab that both he and Abishai would both be overpowered by the enemies. He just thought, well, surely the Lord is going to bring this to pass. And, and so that's just so great. He, he just knew that the Lord was going to help him. And that's that's great. In verse 12, you have his, his um, encouragement to Abishai. And Joab's encouragement here is the perfect approach for you in every part of your life. Here's what he says. We're going to be valiant for God and for his people, for his cities. We're going to be courageous. We're going to be great for him. And then let the do Lord do what seems good in his sight. Let him do whatever he pleases. We'll do our part. He'll do his part. And it'll all be okay. Or whatever happens, we just have to do our part. And the rest we leave up to God. We're going to come back to that in a couple minutes because I, I love that. It's such, such a, a great idea. All right, chapter 10, verse 18. Here we read, that in the battle, uh, they were able to seize 700 charioteers and 40,000 horsemen. And you're going to see in First Chronicles 19, 18, that it doesn't say they seized 700 charioteers, but 7,000. 700 in one place, 7,000 in another place. And people say, see, that's just a mistake from the Bible. But we don't think that's a mistake. We think that for every chariot, there were 10 men assigned. And so if a chariot driver got killed in battle, another one would immediately step up. And some of the chariots had two people anyway. So you have 10 men for each chariot. And if one of the drivers goes down, another one just immediately steps up and begins to drive that chariot. And so that's why there is this discrepancy between the First Chronicles account and the Second Samuel account. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, this is uh, horrible. This is the second most famous sin in history. This is the sin of David with Bathsheba. Uh, this brings all of us who are believers endless shame. We hate this story. Uh, there is no words to express how awful it is to all of us. But we are also then warned in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So what happened to David could happen to any of us. And we're reminded that David went from being a very, very good man to being a very, very bad man in 24 hours. And it could happen to you. And so there's no room here for arrogance. But we are all greatly ashamed of this story in Scripture. In the Me Too era, uh, it is common for us to read on social media and other places uh, defenses of Bathsheba. Uh, the defenses often say that uh, she had no choice to say no in the power structure that she lived in in those days. And so they want Bathsheba to be completely innocent. We want her to be essentially raped, if not raped, then forced by the power structure of her day. And uh, let me just say that um, we should not go there. All right, David's actions are indefensible. It is his fault, the blame goes to him, case closed, period, right? So that's David. But Bathsheba did not do a good job here. Uh, in the first place, she was bathing in a place where the people on the uh, hillside could look at her. Now, no matter how you try to justify that, all I can say is, my wife wouldn't do that. Why is she doing that? Once again, uh, sure, there is a power structure. On the other hand, uh, we have no reason to believe that Bathsheba resisted this. Uh, we didn't see any scratches on David's face. Nobody heard a woman screaming for help. You say, well, you know, she couldn't do that because of the power structure of her day. Uh, let me just say again, I hope that my wife would scream for help. I hope that my wife would have uh, scratched this man's face. Uh, Bathsheba is not entirely innocent in this, and we should keep all of that straight. 
All right, but still, of course, it's David's fault. One of the worst tragedies in all of this is poor Uriah from start to finish. Okay, so we read about him in chapter 11, verses 6 through 25. Uriah is a Hittite. That is, he's not an Israelite. Uh, he's a Hittite, and he is a mercenary, probably a converted Jewish mercenary, because we see that his name has the word Jehovah embedded in it, and it means Jehovah is my light. So he is converted to the true religion of God, and he is one of David's mighty men. Uh, he is mentioned both in 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles as being one of David's mighty men. So he's, he's a wonderful soldier. He's, he's loyal to David. And here in this story, Uriah is being betrayed by his wife, which is the worst thing of all. And he's at the same time being betrayed by his hero, his king, King David. How awful. The one in, in all of Israel, really in all the world, that you could look to for spiritual leadership. And he is being betrayed by his wife and his hero. How awful. Uh, we see that David has three schemes to cover up his sin. The first scheme is just bring uh, Uriah back home off the battlefield and surely he'll sleep with his wife and then we can say it's his child. That didn't work. And then second scheme is I'll get him drunk. And then he'll go and sleep with his wife and we'll say that the child is his child. And that didn't work. So last of all, it is uh, a message that Uriah carries in his own hand, his own death sentence, hands it to Joab. And the message is put Uriah in the worst part where the most valiant men on the other side are fighting and then retreat from him so that he dies. And of course, that's exactly what happens. In verse 24, we realize that not only did Uriah die, but in the message to King David, uh, we hear some of the soldiers died from the archers, and Uriah also died. So in other words, this whole ridiculous plan to get too close to the wall was, was done for the benefit of David to, to destroy Uriah, but Uriah wasn't the only innocent individual who died. And, you know, it's just, it's just rotten, it's corrupt, and we'll say more about that in the future. All right, in chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, you have this poignant story in Scripture of Nathan's parable. And you remember the parable that this, this rich man has plenty of flocks and herds, a poor man only has one female lamb that he treats like his own child. He loves his little lamb. The rich man has a, a visitor, a guest, and he doesn't want to um, have any of his flocks and herds uh, set aside for this stranger. And so he goes to the poor man and takes his only lamb and prepares it for food. And that's that. When David hears this, being a shepherd himself, when David hears this, he said, this man is fit to die for what he's done. This is terrible. And then he says, and he should not only die, but he should pay back the sheep four times, which of course is good Old Testament law um, justice. All right. But then Nathan spins around in chapter 12, verse 7, and he says, but David, I'm talking about you. You are the man. One of the most poignant statements in the entire Bible. But David, you're that guy. You're that terrible rich man who could have done anything he wanted to do, and you picked down someone who had no resources like yours. You are the man. And in Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, you can read about how David felt at this moment that the tremendous weight of guilt, he's actually sick, physically sick from his guilt of this. In And this whole text, we're going to see the terrible consequences, the terrible outcomes of what we call forgiven sins. David's sins are forgiven. And that's why in verse 13, it says, the Lord has put away your sins. You know, you've repented and the Lord has put them away. He, he's taken them away, washed away in the blood of Jesus. Your sins are taken away by God. But just because your guilt is taken away, that doesn't mean that the outcomes, the consequences are taken away. You notice that uh, the word punishment and penalty are the same. In the beginning, we have P-U-N-P-E-N, -E but you know those uh, vowels come and go, right? So punishment and penalty, they're the same, same root. And sometimes people say, well, God would never punish a believer. You can do that if you want to, meaning that God does not punish a believer out of anger. True, fine, whatever, good. 
But the word punishment has the idea of penalty. And God does still absolutely send penalties for forgiven sins. Still. And it's because when you're reading over there, <clears throat> for example, in 1 Timothy <clears throat> excuse me, 5.19, <clears throat> you see that uh, Paul says, The elders that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. In other words, God has to have negative consequences. He has to make the sinner a negative example so that other people won't follow suit. You see? And so there is a penalty. There is a punishment, if you want to call it that. And these are penalties, punishments, consequences, outcomes for forgiven sins. So never forget that just because the Lord washes away your sin doesn't mean that he has to make you somehow immune from outcomes that come when you've been a negative example. All right, and then in chapter 12, verse 8, you see the Lord explaining his heart to David. He says, I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have given you many more such things. I made you king. I gave you both the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and I was going to give you even more things than that. Once again, consequences, outcomes, negative outcomes for forgiven sins. I was going to give you more than that. And so you see what happens if you sin. So many good things that might have come your way can now not come your way. So it was with David. In chapter 12, verse 10, the Lord says, So because of this, the sword will never depart from your house. And oh, we're going to see that in the rest of David's life in the, in the chapters to come. And you see in chapter 12, verse 14, once again, this this powerful, colorful, poignant thought. You have given the enemies of the Lord opportunity to blaspheme. Blaspheme means to insult, to speak against. Um, you have given the enemies of the Lord an opportunity here to think badly of the Lord and his religion, to talk badly of the Lord and his religion. And that is a grave, a grave error. And so in our lives, we don't want to live in a way that makes people say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's how Christians are. I mean, we just can't let that happen. In chapter 12, verses 15 through 23, you see the death of David and Bathsheba's baby boy. And, you know, it's a terrible thing. In chapter 12, verse 23, David says, I shall go to him. I can't bring him to me, but someday I'm going to go to him. This is a reminder that all babies go to heaven when they die. And we're going to say more about that when we come to the book of Romans. But for now, just notice that all babies go to heaven when they die. And David said, I can't bring him to me, but I'm going to go to him someday. And for anybody who's lost a loved one, particularly anyone who's lost a baby, these are wonderful words of comfort. In chapter 12, verses 24 and 25, we have the birth of Solomon, which is a grand occasion. The Bible says the Lord loved Solomon. And we see in chapter 12, verses 26 through 31, another defeat of the Ammonites, and David's life kind of goes back to normal. And that's how we conclude chapter 12. All right, so now we have to talk about what should be our great life lesson in all of this, okay? And we want to go back to Joab's words to his brother Abishai. <clears throat> Excuse me. He says, fight valiantly for God and for his people, and let the Lord decide the rest of the story. We have our part, our part to be courageous, to fight valiantly. And then we just have to let God do his part. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardship. Be brave, be courageous, fight valiantly. But then you have to leave the outcome to God. It's not your responsibility. You flip the switches and change the light bulbs in your house, but you leave the electricity to the power company. And that's what we're doing in the Christian life. We'll do everything we know to do, but the magic has to come from God. So that should be our prayer, okay? Let's pray to be strong for the Lord, valiant for the Lord and for his people, but then leave the real magic of life, and we're using magic in the best possible sense, the magic of life to God himself. So I hope you'll pray in your heart as I pray uh, out loud. Father God, we ask that you will indeed help us to be brave, to be valiant for you and for your people, that we do a really, really good job for you. And Lord, that we would pull out all the stops and be excellent in this world for you. But then Lord, we also now confess that we really can't do very much weak as we are. And so now 
having done our very best, we now say that we are going to leave the real magic of life to you. And we commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you today. I hope you fight valiantly for your Lord today, and I sure hope I get to see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining me for day 103 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. Bye-bye.